All right, so welcome back. So if you're watching this screencast, that means that you are one of my honors biology students because please remember that you're going to have one additional target in Chapter 7. Now, this target is going to focus on Section 7.4, and we're going to be looking at homeostasis and the cells. So looking at this first slide, you're going to notice we're going to be talking specifically about unicellular organisms. Now, the prefix uni basically means one. So we're going to be looking at one cell creatures. Now the term we're going to be focusing on is going to be the term homeostasis. Now the definition for homeostasis is a relatively constant, and that's an important word here, internal physical and chemical condition. So when you talk about one cell creatures, I want you to remember that one cell creatures are made up of lots of different cell parts, and those cell parts are called organelles. And those organelles must have a relatively constant set of internal internal physical and chemical conditions to function properly. Now single-celled organisms like protozoans, yeast, algae, and the bacteria of course are definitely considered alive. Now we know they're considered alive because they definitely maintain homeostasis which means those cell parts work together to maintain that organism. Now we know that these single-celled creatures also definitely grow. If you think about a cell that's divided, um, those two resulting cells will be a little bit smaller than the adult. Um, these cells definitely do respond to the environment, which means that if you expose them to certain types of stimuli, those cells are going to respond in some way. They definitely do transform energy. If you think about um, a plant cell, for example, that cell is going to collect solar energy from the sun, and it's going to transform it into a chemical energy that the plant can use as food. Then, of course, definitely cells do reproduce, which means they do make more of their own kind. So again, these are all the characteristics that we would use to determine whether or not something is alive. But for this particular screencast, we're going to focus primarily on homeostasis. So looking at this next slide, you're going to notice now we're going to start talking a little bit about multicellular organisms. So in the previous slide, we looked at unicellular organisms or one-cell creatures. Now we're going to be looking at organisms such as ourselves. So if you think about us, we are made up of trillions and trillions of cells. Now we have lots of different types of cells that are found within our body. And each cell is going to have a specific job to carry out in that body. So again, they're going to be very specialized for their task. Now we have two examples here. On the left, you're going to see human trachea epithelial cells. Now, epithelial is a word that oftentimes is going to refer to skin. So what we think about here is we think about the skin within our trachea. And so what these cells do is they have lots of cilia, and you can see the cilia which look like little feathers coming off of each of the cells. And these cilia are going to be there to catch debris or small particles as we breathe in. So basically they act to filter the air that we breathe. Now on the right hand side this is going to be another type of specialized cell that's going to be found in plants. Um, these are pollen grains. Now pollen is a type of reproductive cell for plants and these pollen grains are kind of unique because what they have is they have sort of um, what look like small wings attached to the pollen grain. Now again, a pollen is going to be a reproductive type of cell. Now with plants, sometimes you have to have a way to be able to get those um, seeds or pollen to different areas of the environment. So in this case, in pine trees, the pollen is going to use these wings to basically um, enable them to be carried by the wind so they can find their way to the seed cone. Maybe a seed cone that's not necessarily very close to the tree where it originated from, but maybe one that's far away. So again, this is going to be two examples of cells that are very unique. So again, in multicellular organisms, we have specialized cells which, again, have specialized tasks, but they need to be able to work together to maintain that stability or that homeostasis. So because of the specialization that we see in um, cells in regards to multicellular organisms, what this does is it allows us to create hierarchical levels of organization. Now when you think about the word hierarchy, you basically are talking about um, an order to things. So in this case we're talking about the order of cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and of course how they are used to make up the organism itself. So the example that you see down below, this example is looking at a cell that you might find in the lung of an organism. So when we think about that cell, we need to understand that that cell is going to be used to create or make the tissue that you're going to find in the organ, which in this case is going to be 
the lung. Now, of course, that organ, when you put it together with other parts of the body, are going to be used to create a certain system. So in this case, we're going to be talking about the respiratory system. All right. And so again, this represents sort of a hierarchical level of organization. We start with something very small. We put these small bits and pieces together to form something a little bit bigger, which in this case would be the tissue. We take that tissue, we put it together to form something called an organ. Then, of course, we take this organ, maybe along with other organs, and that becomes what we call an organ system. And as I said, in this case, this is going to be the respiratory system. So, of course, we take that system and we pair it with other systems within the organism, say, for example, the digestive system and maybe the excretory system. And all of those systems put together are going to create the organism um, that you are looking at. Now, Another example you might see over here on the right hand side is going to take it even a little bit further. We're starting at the very basic piece. We're starting at the atomic level. That atom is going to be used to create the DNA molecule that you see here. That DNA is going to be found within the nucleus of the cell. So that's going to be found at the organelle level. Now that organelle is going to, as we said, be found within the cell itself. Now that cell is going to be used to create tissue. That tissue is going to be used to create the organ, which in this case is going to be the liver. And of course, that organ is going to be used to create the organ system, which in this case, we're going to be talking about the digestive system. Then as we make our way around, of course, a lot of systems put together are going to be used to create that organism. So because of the huge variety of cells that we see in multicellular organisms, we need to understand that these cells are not considered independent. They're actually considered interdependent and that means that they must be able to work together. Now the only way that they can work together is if they form a very effective way to communicate with each other and they're going to communicate with each other using various different types of chemical signals. Now there are going to be some cells that will form what we call a connection um, to another cell and this is going to be called a cellular junction. Now if you look up here in the upper right hand corner you're going to notice we have a pair of neurons and those neurons are forming a cellular juncture right about here. Now signals that are going to pass through these junctions are only going to be received if the cell has the right receptor. Now that receptor is going to be made of protein and that pr protein is going to have a specific shape, kind of similar to what we had talked about when we had talked about the active site in enzymes. So that protein is going to have a specific shape that is going to mold or basically hold on to a specific type of molecular messenger. So we're not communicating in regards to um, talking or verbal communication, we're communicating in regards to chemical messages. In other words, um, chemicals that have a certain type of shape or size. And only if they can fit in the right receptor is that message going to be received. Now if you look down here towards the, the middle part of our screen, we have an example of um, a beating heart. And this is going to be another example of using those junctions to communicate to the cells that make up this organ. So electrical signals are going to pass through the junctions and those junctions are going to allow the heart to contract. And when that heart contracts, it's going to pump blood to various parts of the body. So again, if you look at these two, and in essence, they're working together because the information that comes from the brain, which is where you're going to find the neurons, and then it's going to travel down through the spinal cord, and eventually we'll have nerves that will be connected to this heart. That information is going to stimulate or communicate the message that this heart must beat. And of course, once the message is received, the heart's going to beat, and it's going to pump the blood to various parts. So this is going to be our last screencast for Chapter 7. So in addition to completing the screencast notes for 7.3, please make sure that you have also completed the screencast notes for 7.4.